going live. Look at this mess. So going live means updating a video and uploading a video while also getting ready to stream a video. It, that's actually how I adjust my webcam. For those of you who don't know, see, look, it fixes the brightness on there. <laughs> oh man. So I uh, just uploaded a video because it's now available. It said private. Watch this. Let me reload the page. Tommy from Lawrence Systems. We're going to talk about And it's not private now. Woo! 22 views. I literally hit upload before I hit the live stream. Um, yeah, I wanted to get the latest version of uh, PF Sense 2, 4, and 5, the update out there and up so people can, I don't know, stare at it and gawk at it or whatever. But uh yeah, it's out. So get to updating. <laughs> but we're going to start with some hot sauce before we dive into all this. Also, I mean, if anyone hasn't seen my workflow, this is um, this is the a whole workflow for when I'm do, uh, doing everything. I have a window here. Here's how I edit the graphics. Here's GIMP and uh, for uploading everything, which I'm going to close now. And uh, so you kind of get an idea of how all this looks behind the scenes for doing it. Matter of fact, because I run GIMP with an app image, I do this so I can see if there's any problems with the encoder and watch all the logs scroll by, blah, blah, blah. So fun stuff. Um, would you use a Synology as a VM storage device? Eh, they should work. I've not used any Synology as a VM storage, but they should work as a VM storage. It's something that's within their capability of doing. Uh, so there's that. The... Uh, Cool. All right. So let's start with the hot sauce before we dive into playing with PF Sense. Because you guys, you know, I did a video on it, but we'll get to play with it here and things like that. Um, I just grabbed some of Dad's. Oh, that's not going to work at all, will it? Hold on. Well, this is. There we go. Dad's Chipotle Jalapeno Sauce. This is uh, what we're going to start with. I, I did not feel like going in my um, studio right now. I, I've, we've cleaned it up. There's not too many projects in there. There's taxes in there right now. And I said, well, they're organized. And if I move them, they're not organized because my wife came in and helped organize me. Uh, that's that's a challenge occasionally. So that's, um yes, that's going to be an issue. Anyways, we'll try a little bit of sauce. I haven't had this one in a while. And I, I have no idea if this actually keeps you healthy or not, but it seems like a good idea to keep eating it because I, I'm always eating hot sauce. So <clears throat> shake it up a little bit, try some hot sauce, and then we'll get started talking about technology while everyone gets here. Oh, look at this. This is a uh, chipotle jalapeno sauce. Oh, good. But I say it all about all the hot sauces. The ones I don't care for is like Dave's Insanity. All these other ones like this are great. I don't know where this is from Pear Blossom Farms. I believe it's local to Colorado. Um, someone we know from Colorado sent us these, uh, a vendor we work with. So that was kind of cool of them uh, to do that. So let me put me back over here and read some of these questions and answer some of them. Wow, you guys, you guys are hammering on this right away. Wow, look at all these questions. Hello from New Hampshire, Moscow. Hello from Moscow. Woohoo. Ah. Uh, just updated 2.5, work fine, no issues. Yes, that is the new update. We, uh, The newest update right now is 2.4.5 release. So I, I've updated the lab. I haven't updated our main machines with it because it's the middle of the day and we're busy. That We're going to talk about that in a minute. Um, just released, blah, blah, blah. I just hit the button. Yep. 2.4.5. Uh, 2.30, people ask what time I'm going to be here. Yep, I just posted a 245 video. I did that before I did here. <laughs> We're live on the new video, but not on the stream. Yes, I just pushed that new video. It's going to, I did both concurrently. Why not do everything at the same time, right? Uh, we need Tom. All right, that's where that starts. Some people pressing T. All right, an error occurred. Well, I'm sorry for your errors. Who else is in here? Willie Howe's in here. Hello, Willie Howie. So, New Hampshire. Moscow's still cool. I, I like the fact that people are from, I don't know really where, if you're from Moscow, but it says you're from Moscow, so I'm happy. That's, that's kind of cool. I like a global audience. It makes it pretty cool. Hello from India, another uh, person on the other continent over there. That's cool. <laughs> Willie. Willie's local, kind of. Willie's local compared to Moscow, but he's not technically local because uh, Willie's in another state than I am. So he's not quite as, quite as close. Uh, you know, he's closer than Moscow, but that's about it. <laughs> mm. Anyways, 
VPN's full. That's the real problem. We've been, we, um, I just did a video on tuning VPNs and I've been on, I was just on the phone with another customer. They're upset because they're conflating the fact that, um, they're not real upset, but I mean, I just explained to them and I gave them a solution. Now, I, I don't say it's your problem. I do offer solutions. And the problem is, and this is why I did the tuning, uh, tuning video that is directly from the NetGate documents of how you can tune this. And one of the challenges this particular client has is bandwidth. They said before they switched to being remote, can we have unlimited users? The answer is yes, but you don't have unlimited bandwidth. You can load as many users, but they share all the same pool of bandwidth. This is the challenge. So now they have too much bandwidth being pulled and that's where some of these challenges come in. So what I'm doing is um, explaining them how to split tunnel the VPN because you don't need all the traffic over there. So that's been a, um, you know, more than one person. We're doing VPN for right now, my other staff. I was the one answering the phone because the staff is all busy doing right now. So it's been uh, definitely pushing it. But <clears throat> in my video, I do cover all the highlights and the new version and um, things like that for this. So I'm not gonna bore you with every little detail, but one of the things I thought was really nice when we go over here to uh, DCP server. We have a search function. So you can do this now. Yay. Matter of fact, if you go here to ARP table where there's usually more things, you can do things like search for a specific MAC address in the ARP table. And if you've ever had, whoops, if you've ever had to do this, uh, this helps quite a bit when you're trying to find groups of machines in a table. Really nice. I love the way this is one of the features of all the things they had in there. This one particular is pretty, uh, pretty cool. They also, I, I don't remember exactly what, I remember it was quirky and they fixed some quirkiness with the monitoring, which is right here. So this is the monitor that allows you to, we're going to have a processor versus traffic versus, uh, let's say WAN traffic and update graph selection. And this can be handy when you're trying to do capacity planning with PFSense uh, because you go, hey, I need to know how much memory is in use when I have this much traffic over the open VPN. So you cross reference left and right access to these things and update graphs and it kind of gives you that information across. There's nothing running on open VPN, so there's no real data here. So definitely kind of cool that they've uh, fixed that. So um, there's a lot of other little changes. I One of the things that's really amazing for the PFSense project and the FreeNAS too. Both of them are uh, two of my favorite projects because of the level of documentation that they're really solid about keeping up with. Um, so they have all this well done documentation right here that is up to the minute. Matter of fact, here's the updates and features and changes for the new 2.5. Even though this isn't out, they're keeping a list of all the changes that are in here for the 2.5.5 version. So if you want to help out and test on that, there's all kinds of um, <clears throat> the same thing. They got a constant update of all the uh, changes as they're being made. And of course, they have a link to all the open bugs because that's when you're dealing with the beta, there's all the open bugs. So something pretty cool there. So definitely a lot of documentation, a lot of knowledge being dropped here. Uh, did they finally add 2FA? Nope, they did not. Which I just, it'd be novel. I, I don't think it's the... It, it's, I think it's better to have it, but it's not the end of the world if you don't have it on inside thing like a firewall. Um, it'd be nice, but it's not like you should be public. This should ever be public facing. So there's that. You can also, if you want, you can lock the web interface out so it doesn't have access and SSH in. And if you did that, you would actually have keyed access only. So you SSH in and tunnel it with proxy chains. That would eliminate the web interface altogether from being an external threat, well, internal or external threat being accessed. So if you wanted to have your tinfoil hat on, um, that's definitely a way to do it. What else do we have in here? Um, Cat eight with your home lab. Hey, have at it, man. Uh, do, 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 do. Hello from San Francisco. Uh, what else did I have to talk about? So I... I am playing a lot with XCPNG and I also want to, maybe we should set, I wonder if I can set this up at the same time right now. Hmm. Um, I'm going to be doing some snort videos because a lot of people ask about application filtering and what you're running into and whoops, let me reopen the closed tab here. 
Tommy here from Lawrence Systems. We're going to talk about PFSense 2. There we go. Let me load Snort on this one right now. So System, Package Manager. And what I'm getting is a lot of requests on application filtering. This is something that you can't do inside of the Sericata, but Snort does have. And uh, let's go over here. Application ID detection with application open ID. This will help you identify some of the applications running on the network. It's only as accurate as the IDs and the tags it can read, which so many things get encrypted, it doesn't understand them. But nonetheless, that's uh, a feature that a lot of people ask about. So I'm going to do an updated snort video and talk specifically about once it's set up about the application ID detection for people that really are diving into that particular aspect of it. <clears throat> so AES and I CPU is not a requirement for 2.45. I have done videos on this. I have beat people over the head that it's, you know, no one believes me. Um, I still get questions here in 2020 asking that same silly question. They mentioned it once a couple years ago. I think in 2018, it's been like two years and everyone can't let go of that they were thinking about doing it. And they think that means it's needed. It's not. They've done it in every piece of uh, video update they can do, the blog post. Every every time they keep answering it, no one no one seems to believe anyone because it was once said. I don't know how that um, how that is so stuck in people's heads. It's one of those weird things for sure. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. Let's see. Uh, wondering if you could do try out Brave Browser. I haven't had a real interest in it. Um, it looked interesting, but not that interesting. It wasn't compelling to me. I, I just didn't see um, I, nothing about it made me go, uh, you know, that made me think that I needed to use it. Like there, th things kind of have to have a killer feature. Maybe I missed something. Maybe just because it's something new, I should use it. I like Firefox a lot. So I think Brave has some cool concepts, but there's not enough in there that makes me really think it's like the end thing. Uh, Willie's got a good question. Have you had any HIPAA compliance companies running their own unified controllers on-prem? And we have very, any of their clients that do the compliance, I can't think of any of them that have a controller on-prem. Um, there are companies though, and I didn't, I'm not part of this, but we set up their on-prem controller and they're in a compliance industry. I don't ask what happened because we didn't do their compliance. They contracted us, their, their internal IT contracted us. And I know by the nature of them working in medical that they are, they have to pass compliance. They have an on-site controller. They do have it on a separate network. We helped them configure all this. But to my knowledge, and it's been in there for two years now, matter of fact, we were just engaging them, engaging with them today for another project. Um, they've never said anything or had questions about HIPAA. So that I know of, there's no issues, but it should, it's, they have it properly set up. So it's on not the general uh, network, but it's on the, they have a separate control plane. So they do have a VLAN separate for um, management of the network and network devices. So that's where they put the controller at. And it's in the same network as the devices. And then the devices have VLANs um, to control guests and access to the medical staff um, on separate, each one's a separate network, separate VLAN. So I haven't seen any compliance complaints from them. They haven't asked me for any assistance to get things in compliance. So I'll assume, because they do have to pass compliance, that they've passed compliance. But I, I've never asked them uh, outright, which I hope that's an accurate answer for you, Willie. <laughs> Uh, so you have a VPN uh, between two sites, but trouble accessing OpenVPN. I'm going to be doing some new OpenVPN videos to try to get people started on that. My other ones are from, you know, they're, they're older, they're still accurate, but the interface has changed ever so slightly. And sometimes if you don't give people exact instructions or easily miss something. And uh, so that's why I want to do it. That's also why I did that zero tier video. I've talked about how you could use zero tier in the longer video. I did the little 10 minute video of how to use zero tier for things like um, connecting remotely for RDP. <clears throat> uh, zero tier users for accessing a Synology NAS. I don't, I would prefer OpenVPN. Um, if I was going to do it, OpenVPN is the uh, 
I, OpenVPN is more ideal. And the reason why is you have a routed network with OpenVPN where you are actually, you know, coming in and uh, let me just, let's pull up diagrams of stuff. Do, 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 whoops, not news, images. Someone's always got a map. You don't have to draw things. Everyone else draws something, right? So anytime you have the OpenVPN server, because the OpenVPN is directly coming in, this is a terrible idea to pull this particular one up. Where's someone that has something there? No, that's a promo for soft ether. Once you're using VPN, you have full access to the network instead of a singular device. And I think people have a really hard time understanding how some of the networking works. So each device on your network needs a gateway to get back to where it's supposed to do. So when you bring access to a certain device or I had someone running OpenVPN on their, uh, I think it was Unraid, someone had messaged me and they're like, hey, I can't get to other devices. Well, they don't have the right gateway. When you do it at your firewall level, your firewall can push all the routes to your through your OpenVPN or whatever you're using for VPN, OpenVPN popular with PFSense. Um, and then it has all the routing for all of the devices. And then that device has all the reverse routes that bring it back there. So now you don't have to do any extra routes. The challenge you run into is if you load OpenVPN on something like FreeNAS or whatever, uh, or Unraid, when you do that, there's no routes back. The way you solve that problem, and I thought about maybe I'll do a routing video, but you add static routes. So you'll add a bunch of static routes back and forth, and it's just, it, it makes it very more complicated network. It's not something it's impossible to do, but uh, it's a challenge because of these static routes coming back. Um, oh, I see, Willie's asking because their current uh, controller fails PCI. Huh. I don't know. I guess I wouldn't know why it challenges it. So, but anyways, this is the challenge of running OpenVPN or whatever your VPN solution is on a device within the network versus running it on the router itself. Whenever you run a VPN on a router, you're just going to have a better result. So it's going to be a lot uh, better. In, in overall, in performance, in troubleshooting especially, because now you have one point of contact where it comes in. And the VPNs are not hard to set up on here. Um, I don't have any set up right now. It's not a big deal to go through and set them up real quick and log into it. it it's pretty fast to get OpenVPN up and running so you can get to something on the other side of that. Uh, matter of fact, I have Windows 10 on the other side of this particular network. Let me make sure this one's online. Is it online? It should be. This is when you build out your virtual lab. Um, couldn't get to that. It does have an IP address. Let's see if it's got a lease or not. Services, actually, we'll go back over here to Windows. Do, 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 do. Close all. I'm going to blame Internet Explorer. Ten dot one dot ten dot one. Okay, I can ping it. So I just got to create some rules on there. <laughs> um, we'll play with that in a second. Um, if you don't just add routes uh, with a site to site VPN, the setup uh, does not work instead. Well, that's the thing. You only need to. Uh, you do need to have the route set up. So let's run through the wizard on this one and walk walk through it. Why not? So we go over here, diagnostics. Um, let me back it up real quick, just so I have a base of, what do we got here? Before YouTube. All right, uh, I think all this stuff can go away. Yep, anyways, um, this is the before YouTube option. What I do is I do like to have a backup, a snapshot. That way, we after we go the, here and run these wizards, and there's no VPN right now, so let's add one. Next. Next. Cool. Test VPN, 11.94. That's fine. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, we'll definitely use some 
Oh, the hardware is not enabled on this one, so we'll set that up. Now, this is the part that people, this is where we have these networks on here. So we have the local network, concurrent connections, and uh, force all client traffic through the tunnel is one way to do it, or you can put the networks in like this. So if we put the networks in, well, let me pull up a little note I have. So is it space? I always forget, is it space? Yeah, there we go, commas. So we're gonna go over here. Let me pull this up real quick. So we have two different, two different networks. We have this one here, copy, scroll down, comma, zero slash 24. And this is the important part right here is that you put in each of the local networks you want this VPN to access. So I think that's all we need. I don't think there's any other changes I need to make. Do, 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 do. WAN, do do do, AES, no hardware. Save. Create the rules, finish. And that's it. We've now created the VPN. Uh, we're using AES 256 CBC 2048 here. There's the tunnel network. And OpenVPN is up and running. So what I've done is, and let's go over here. Uh, if you go and look at the VPN, now that it's created, we go back to edit. And this is the part I just, a lot of people miss is having these networks in here. So let's say in this particular setup only has two networks, which we'll pull up uh, right here. Here's those two networks. If you have both those networks, great. Actually, let me move myself out of the way a little bit. So if you have these two networks, these you have to add them in manually and this is one of the things that we see a lot of people just didn't do they will go through and go whoops i forgot to put uh that in there and i'll forget to add those networks and if you don't add those networks to it then they're not going to route over the network so let's go ahead and uh let's see what else do we have i don't think i have to do anything else to this vpn i think it's just basic um, well, let me catch up on the questions real quick. <laughs> uh, oh, Willie tried Brave, but it kept freezing up on the edge routers. That's interesting. Uh, someone says the Chrome only better. I, I don't know. Like I said, it, it, browsers are your biggest piece of your attack surface. This is one of the challenges I have with browsers is because um, browsers being the main way that people interface uh, with the internet, they are your huge attack surface. That attack surface means I care a lot about the browser. Um, oh, did it default to SHA-1? Probably. I, I, if, I, if I cared, it, securing it, uh, hardened, secure. Yes, you probably want to use something better than that. There's no doubt about that. So, so we're going to go back over here. Someone pointed out that I do SHA-1. Uh, yeah. So what are we going to do here? Oh, we just want user auth. And then someone says, don't do SHA-1. So we'll change that over here. So we should do... I don't know. So SHA-1 56-bit, or should we do one of these other ones here? This is just for the, the algorithm for authentication channel packets. Uh, we're also wrapping this inside of a TLS key. So I'm not too worried about it if we wanted to change it. Someone's going to complain about it. Not For, for purposes of what we're going to test here, I'm not that worried about it. Actually, let me drag these back over here. <laughs> it's hard to keep up with all the questions. Just use links for your browser. I'm going to go. I like Sam Sheridan's answer. Use links. Absolutely. Yeah. I, Chrome or Firefox are solid browsers and are really solid on the updates. That's what worries me about Brave because now you have this potential um, new thing that you're like, well, maybe it won't have a problem. But yeah, it's I, I worry a little bit about it. So let's download this and uh, let me find a place to put the file. So do, 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 make a temp folder.
All right, and we'll go in here. So we go here to CD downloads. All right, now this should enable my computer to be on the other side of the network. And I think, um, hey, look, right there we go. These are the links. And if you're not familiar, this is a troubleshooting tip for you people trying to get OpenVPN working. So please note these networks. And let me actually do a disconnect. So I'm going to disconnect. And we're just going to do... So when I'm on the VPN, it's telling me if the network is 10.1.10.1.0, the route is 192.168.70.1. If the network is 192.168.40.0, the route is 192.68.70.1. This is very, very important. This is one of the troubleshooting problems you can run into. Now what's happening if you do this, let's say you run open VPN on a free NAS, now free NAS brings it in, but doesn't have this other routing information to get to the other networks. So now you have to add those extra routing configurations. And hence the kind of the topic that started this was why should you run OpenVPN on the router only? And this is essentially why. So you can push all the routes. Now this is routes on my computer, but now you kind of get the same idea. Those same routes have to exist elsewhere for things to know to get back to OpenVPN. So hopefully that makes a little bit of sense for doing that. And you've seen how quick it was just to set the open VPN up on this uh, and be connected. And let me spin up actually another virtual machine in here. So go here. Uh, we got here Debian on lab server. Let's connect it to the network. Uh, this network. This will put it behind the PFSense in my lab. I have not used any AMD epics yet. Uh, I've talked to people, my friend, I had a good discussion with my friend who just built an epic server last night. He loves it. He's been running it for a little while and super happy with it. Um, he says it was worth all the money he spent on it. So he, he can't sing enough praises for the epic servers. I'm, I'm pretty jealous that he's got it. So. <laughs> um, Let's see, someone said, uh, <laughs> distribute network on floppy disk. Oh, I remember those days, man. Loading Netscape off the floppy disk. Those are probably in a drawer somewhere. Or maybe not. I purge a lot of things. I'm, I'm not someone that keeps a lot of that old junk, but for sure, the, at one time, there was a lot of that. Let's see, pingnews.com. All right, so this is behind the PFSense as well. So, uh, let's see. Yeah, the Epic ones are... Doo -doo -doo. My friend built an entire Proxmox setup with Epic, and he loves it. He says it works really, really nice. Uh, someone else said... Um, Someone else had commented on what's a quiet server. It really depends on your budget. Uh, I will admit, I did a review on that Dell R630. I don't know if that's your budget or not. It's a more expensive system. But that Dell 630 that we're running is very, very quiet, very power efficient. Matter of fact, um, let's log into the iDRAC on it. It's a great server for uh, running these... Uh, virtual machines and that's what it's running right now is xcpng do 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 and if we go to the power and thermal this is running in production right now with um load on it for my staff doing stuff and uh power and thermal whoop, where'd it go there we go it's chilling at 112 watts. And then I showed in my video, it's like 50 decibels. It's really quiet. So I'm pretty impressed with this, but I don't know if this fits your budget or not. So, uh, uh, 620 is probably cheaper, but the 620 does use a little bit more power. 
So the efficiency on the 630 seems, as I as I understand it, I didn't have side by side comparisons, um, but I think there is some wattage efficiency. But either way, this is with dual power supplies. It's 112. If you go with a single power supply, which is fine for a home lab, um, you'll save a few wattage, and you and you can still order it with dual. Just pop one of them out. So not not too big of a deal to do that. Now, if it's in your basement, yeah, you're not going to hear it. So it kind of depends. Are you are you wanting this in the same office as you, or do you want it in the other room? Because once it goes in the other room, well, now not a big deal at all. So um, have I played with WireGuard? Very limited. I like WireGuard. One, it needs a code audit. I, I keep telling people that. You want me to protect my critical and precious information with an unaudited VPN software. No. Uh, I think it has a huge potential. I love that it runs in kernel space. There's everything good about it, but it just needs to go through some code audit and get more mainstream support. So uh, good news is the folks over at NetGate are, uh, let me pull it, let's see, Reddit are PFSense. And if you look for... WireGuard. NetGate is sponsoring WireGuard. So what you're looking at here is the actual um, pull request and everything else. They're contributing the code to do the integration on here. So you can see he's sponsored by Rubicon Communications, LC Network. Um, they're adding the support for kernel-wide WireGuard. So not it, and this is something bigger than just adding it into PFSense. They're actually contributing the code to the BSD side of it. So it'll come downstream into PFSense. So I think WireGuard is really cool. Um, I think it's something great to play with. I, I'm not ready to use it for my world. But then again, for me particularly, VPN speed is not my constant concern at, in, at, at all. So for me, it's not been an issue using OpenVPN. Um, and it's not like you're going to go quadruple or eight times as fast just by using the same hardware with WireGuard. Um, it's good. Don't get me wrong. It's going to be faster and more efficient, but it's not like it's like, hey, it's like 100 times faster and everything's going to be amazing. Um, a lot of times with uh, reasonable hardware, the limitation you run into with OpenVPN is usually your internet provider before it's the um, VPN, depending on the hardware you're running. Obviously, you're running slower hardware that's that like an SG1100, which I'm a big fan of, but that's going to make a huge difference on that. Um, the simplicity configure, yes. I like the fact that it has much less code. That's going to mean much, much less code to audit, much less code for attack surface, much, much less code to go wrong. So don't get me wrong. I love it for all of those reasons. WireGuard's awesome. I just haven't really stopped to do a video on it um, because I'm waiting for it to become mainstream and kind of just integrated. Once it becomes mainstream and integrated, I'll do some videos on it. Uh, right now, it's just kind of fun to play with. It's not hard to stand up. It's relatively reasonable, so um, it's not too bad. Uh, let's see. You know, the R630 use is not even expensive. Um, we have a toilet paper giveaway today with the live stream. Yeah, we could thought thought about it. That'd be funny. That's still a concern for some people. <laughs> Do I normally have family time or am I always working? I Yeah, I have family time. Um, I make sure I slice out. It only seems because I'm always busy doing stuff uh, and I do work a lot of hours, but I also frequently take time to go hang out. Uh, me and my son go do things and everything else. So it's not, it's not all work. I, I do keep some level of balance. So uh, I've actually just been hiring more people to run my business so I can do more videos. So I still run my business. I run my business more than... 50% of my time is still running the business. The other, I'm not going to say 50% of the time is videos because uh, it varies. It, it's not like I can easily track it. That's the best way to describe it. I do spend a pretty decent um, time doing videos, but yeah. Uh, let's see. What kind of business am I running? An IT services company. I always say, learn more about me or my company, head over to lawrencesystems.com. If you want to know what my company does, you just go to my website, lawrencesystems.com. It's got all kinds of stuff about what we do. 
And I got this fancy little time-lapse video in the middle of it to kind of give you a better idea of what we do. We do wiring, we do cabling, we do um, technology support, and we eat hot sauce, and uh, we post a lot of videos and all that fun stuff. We do RMM monitoring and uh, MSP work and projects. I can hear bids going on on the other side of the wall here. Uh, so we do a lot of projects. Uh, matter of fact, that's why I was looking over here. One of my other... Um, <laughs> someone said I'm giving away toilet paper. Wiring except fiber. Well, the fiber gets contracted through us, so yes, no on the fiber. We don't actually have anyone who does fiber splicing. We do the pulling. Uh, we just contract the fiber splicing out. But we actually use a lot of contractors. Uh, that's one of the secrets to my company, if you want to call it a secret. People ask, well, how can you get all this work done with only this many people? I'm like, contractors. Use them on an as-needed basis. Uh, you put a bunch of contractors together and uh, organize the work, and you become a project manager. So... Um, I'm also, I was just seeing, we just had a lift that went bad. These are some of the things. I can't show our company um, one, but let's see here. Like, I, it's one of those things people ask what I deal with, but one of them is going to be, and I, I'll pull this over an example. I'm not even sure what I'm looking. I don't know what broke. I sent this picture. I'm actually not sure by this picture of me. Can I drag this one? No, because it's going to show too much company information. I will screenshot it. That will that will work. I can screenshot and drag the screenshot over. I got this message. I just didn't know what it was about. And then uh, I'll drag this over in a second. But these are some of the things that I have to deal with. Like random picture of this. And I'm like, what's this? And apparently something broke here. I can't tell what's broken, but the lift people knew. And uh, so we have a series of lifts that are on site. And then I have to uh, coordinate the messages. And then I have the uh, rental out, you know, and just to give you an idea, these are what the feeds look like. So we'll snapshot something out of the feed. I, I mean, people ask what I do and coordinating some of this stuff is the what I do. So we're going to go ahead and I don't like leaving some of the contractor names in here or anything like that. I protect people's privacy. But these are the things that we see right here in my chat feed. We use Google Chat. We don't use Slack, but this is very much like Slack. So Fraser Reynolds is replacing one of the lifts we have on site. All right. So uh, this particular uh, job had a company um, dropping off lifts, and then we have to go manage those lifts. And one of the lifts went bad, so now we got to coordinate it. So when I'm not doing this, we're doing some of the cabling stuff, or I was just fielding calls for VPN issues and things like that. So... Yeah. We don't pick up PCs anymore. That is correct. Hey, smash the like button, all 266 of you. It is much, much uh, appreciated when you do that. Also, by the way, and these are, I have not had a chance to watch them. So go over here. And Jay, me and Jay were hanging out last night. We were doing, uh, I got a podcast, I got a post. But he just posted this. He built some low energy storage servers. Um, he also did some videos on installing, um, building a Raspberry Pi storage server, building a low energy storage server, and installing, uh, he has one more. I think he's got one on Kubernetes in here somewhere. He, he also did a whole series on encrypted LVMs. Um, so, I, I'm actually, it is on my to-do list to watch the LVM videos. I'm not good at LVM, and Jay has helped me when I got stuck on an LVM problem. So he's got some videos on it, which I'm pretty excited about. I got them all in my queue to hang out and watch all these. <laughs> but uh, yeah, go subscribe to his channel if you don't. Jay's awesome. A very talented uh, Linux person, I know. <laughs> yes, VPN calls have been crazy. That is for sure. That is what we're doing uh, just so many of it is it, it is hitting a bit much everyone wants a vpn uh if you mix sas and sata at the same time I don't think there's any problems, but I wouldn't try to build a RAID array that had mixed. That would cause problems a lot. So if you're going to build a RAID array out, don't mix the SAS and SATA ones too. 
Um, you can't mix them. I, I believe the system will let you mix them, but the system will give errors on uh, when you plug in a SATA drive to a SAS pl backplane, it says it's something about it's like working in compatibility. I forget what it says. It says something different. Maybe I'll do a test on that. Um, honestly, unless you really, really um, are so constrained or you just happen to have a bunch of uh, SATA drives, if you do a backplane setup, just buy SAS drives. You can get used SAS drives really cheap. Um, you can even buy on eBay 15K SAS. They're not crazy expensive for SAS six gig drives here. Um, obviously you want something bigger. It depends on how large you want them, but you can buy some of these, which are gonna be fast or enterprise drives. Um, you're going to get some really good performance out of these. And of course, you can also get used SAS SSDs, but you just build them with the SAS and life will be better for you in terms of building out the backplane. You'll have better latency and things like that. No, don't. Well, it, like I said, you don't mix the drives in a single array. So if you're building out, let's say I have nine drives, I have uh, three for one array and six for the other array. Don't mix the arrays together. Build three with the 10K ones and, you know, the other six or 15K, you build those together. So don't mix them in the same array. That's the biggest one. Can PFSense do uh, IPsec LTP mobile clients, not OpenVPN, to be routed into different VLANs by user or by incoming WAN IP? I've never tried. Um, so I don't know. It it's got support for that. I've never tried routing them. I don't do many uh, mobile users, but they do have mobile client option in here. Um, actually, right here, it says uh, virtual address pool. And, uh, well, you can do split DNS, P, uh, phase two PF groups, login banner, DNS default domain. There's probably provide a list of accessible networks to the client. So there's probably ways to do it. I've just never really, I, this is something I don't think I've played with them forever, any type of IPsec mobile clients. So um, it's in here. I've never, I haven't done it. You'd have to look through some of the documentation on that. So it probably can do it. Uh, For things like video storage and streaming, SSD is overkill and not cost effective. Uh, did you pull your last HA proxy video? No, I, to my knowledge, I have not. Um, let's take a look. It should be up and running. Go over here to videos. So let's see. Right here. The two wildcard certificates with HA proxy. So here's my two HA proxy videos, both set to public. Uh, one has 14,000 views, one has 5,000 views. So they're still here. And you can always go to my channel. And then you go here, HA. And there's my videos up for it. I, you know, I send people search links like this all the time. Um, I, if people like, did you do a video on? I don't know why some people ask that question. It's actually a really easy answer. Go over and hit search. Type in the thing on my channel that you're looking for. And, you know, I, I fire off this message a lot. And I should just save it this way, query equals. And then I just type in the word and send it to them. <laughs> so, so far, no known issues with the PF Sense build. Here, I'll, for the person to ask, we'll even... There we go. AGA proxy is great. Yeah, it's a nice way to do it. And um, matter of fact, one of the nice things is they keep adding more and more support for more and more DNS authentication servers. So that's actively being developed. They keep there's a long, long list of companies in there. I did it all with DigitalOcean because that just happens to be the one I'm already using. Uh, but there's more than DigitalOcean support in there. Um, uh, did I miss a question here? No, oh, I'm running 16 SATA SSDs from my R720. I was thinking about buying eight SAS drives and building a separate ZFS pool. Yeah, I mean, it kind of depends on use case and things like that. I mean, you can get SAS is a little bit different than SATA, so there's different um, advantages to using it. 
especially when you get into the SSDs. And I just did that performance testing um, on the system. And the performance testing I did with the uh, Zen server with running Windows and, whoops. Oh, in case someone's seen that, um, I, I'll show you something you guys are gonna find funny. Uh, there we go. This is someone you're going to find. Oh, it's broken again. It goes down a lot. Anyways, it turns out um, this particular site, if you can see the URL, I won't say it because I'm afraid it'll get demonetized. They happen to use Let's Encrypt certificates for some of their site. And so my friend who works at Let's Encrypt, uh, uh, we did this because I'm childish sometimes. If you haven't seen this site, so um, because this company uses this, he did not find it amusing as I did. I am childish, so this was absolutely when I found. Oh, I spelled encrypt wrong. When I found out that this particular company that uses this logo um, also uses Let's Encrypt for some of not all their search, but some of their search, this became a discussion topic of amusement for me. Because um, when I type something in, and people are, I know people have uh, found things in my URLs that I have in the history there. So if you're wondering why that's in the history, that's because I was pulling this uh, the CA. Um, certificate transparency report for them. So someone, so I find this greatly amusing. <laughs> I, I don't know, sometimes I'm I, I'm a child. So anyways, in case you're wondering why that's in my search history, <laughs> that's the real reason. <laughs> uh, yeah, don't worry, I'm not human. <laughs> Uh, the default snort rules will alert on Let's Encrypt certs. That's interesting. Uh, yeah, I there's. I think traffic is the modern. I don't know. Use traffic if that's what you want. I like Nginx as a modern proxy. I like HA proxy. HA proxy is very extensible, very powerful. Um, that's why I had so much fun doing all the videos on it. But uh, yeah, I use what you're com use what you know. That's one thing. There's more than one answer in open source, and forcing someone to use something they don't know can cause security issues and everything else. Uh, so if there's two products that are relatively um, at parity with each other, then I will suggest use the one you're more familiar with because you're going to get the job done with better security because it's something uh, in there. Oh, the logo generator. Um, Sure. So I'll send this to my wife. She'll she'll think this is funny. <laughs> really? This is what someone's gonna screenshot on me and and I don't know. I, I can't help it. This is this makes me laugh anyways. Ah uh, so that's definitely amusing. <laughs> So someone, someone's definitely got that. Someone's going to send me this or something. I, I don't know. <laughs> um, HA proxy. It's not HA proxy versus Let's Encrypt. HA proxy plus Let's Encrypt lets you create reverse proxies. It's not a versus thing. It's a those two tools together. I have a whole video on it, so I'm going to quit talking about it because I dive in depth. I walk you through all the steps to get that set up properly. Um, were there other VPN questions anyone had? I think I answered all of them. Uh, I'm going to do another open VPN video. I'm going to walk people through this. I'm going to get them set up. Um, cause I know this is going to be topical again. So I'll probably get those done tomorrow and over the weekend. I, like I said, I got some plans, uh, uh, every, I got some plans over this weekend to do that. Unfortunately, um, I have a couple companies and they've all delayed shipping. So the, Shipping has been delayed. I had a I had a handful of servers that were all supposed to be sent here, and with the current conditions and uh, whatnot, there they told me there's all shipping delays and getting them here. Because I am going to be doing a bunch of server reviews. I'm excited to do them. I'm excited to dive into a bunch of hardware and talk about it. But it's uh, now all that got put on delay. So, eh, what are you gonna do? Uh, why would you connect to Chromecast to the VPN? I, you're not the first person to ask, but I don't always know why people want to do it. I have someone that's going to pay me to set it up like that. And I'm like, I, people do weird things. 
Is HA proxy better than Nginx for reverse proxy? I think in the context of using it with PFSense, yes. I, I found using uh, HA proxy integrated with PFSense to be a better solution. Um, and that's why I have two videos on it. So if you look at my HA proxy videos, uh, you can dive into those details with me and see if it's a solution that works for you as well. Um, Supermicro, they're one of the people. Supermicro is going to be sending me some servers. Uh, they are delayed because of all the lockdown stuff. Someone said, um, maxing out RAM on the NAS as much as possible, yes. So here's 28 gigs of RAM turn for my, um, we have free 0.9 ZFS cache, 28 gigs, services running 1.2 gigs. When you're running, if you want performance out of your NAS, this is how you're going to get it. You're going to stick more and more memory in it. Putting lots of memory in it is how you get the performance out of these. And ignore the fact that it's degraded. I'm going to be doing a video on why this is degraded. Um, the, uh, the rate, I had some rate array trouble with this that was really quirky. And I'm going to do a video because I know other people probably have this quirkiness and I pulled the drive out and made the, made the quirkiness go away. But it turns out the drive is the problem. Uh, it was causing a lot of uh, reboots on this machine. It just kept timing out weird timeout errors on there, but they weren't easy to find. But yes, uh, lots of caching on there. Now, what was the other thing? I, oh, I'm going to do a video. I'm still going to do the finance video. I didn't forget. I just didn't have time to do it. Um, yes, I do have um, plenty of videos uh, on PIA and doing a whole home VPN. It's not, if people like it more than I use it, it's not something I use all the time. So it's, people ask me to do a video on it. That's why I did it. The reality of it is uh, I mostly use, if I use PA, I do it on my local computers. I don't do it also on uh, my whole network and things like that. So yeah, it, but I have a video on how to set it up and it, the video is accurate and it works. And I know a few people that are using it and we've set it up for customers more than once. Um, I, I just got an email from someone else that wants me to set it up for them. So it is definitely something I do. Can you encrypt Nextcloud with HA proxy? Sure can. Uh, I'm going to, I have Nextcloud. Do I have it loaded? Probably not. Let's load Nextcloud while we're sitting here. So Nextcloud. Oh, it is loaded. Okay, cool. Start next cloud. So yes, I'm going to do a video on how to build next cloud with HA proxy. Uh, so you can, you can easily get it and get it encrypted. But I ask people, can you stop opening this up to the public? If you don't know how to keep it up to date, I bring that up because what happens is people load these services and they get all excited about them but then they don't ever update them. And if you don't update these services or you don't know how to update these services, you end up with problems. I don't care if you see the passwords because this is a demo. I don't run Nextcloud in production. So did you, NC admin, I'm already logged in. So this is not a completely configured version of Nextcloud, but it's a start. We got a squirrel in it, some cool pictures. The Nextcloud team, Nextcloud is an amazing piece of software. I still prefer to keep it behind a VPN. That's one of the keys. If you don't put it behind a VPN and you don't update it, uh, you're going to have a bad time because someone will find a problem. They will exploit it and you have it public facing. And sometimes if you're not familiar with how all this works and you're guessing your way through the setup on it, you will have some issues. So good news is they have some updates here. So let's let's see if the updates actually update this. So update to Nextcloud 17.04. We'll let it uh, run here for a minute. Oh boy, this is some of the issues you run into. So a new version is available, 05 now. So open updater, download now, start update, and see if it works. But this is one of the challenges you have when doing this is if you 
if you don't keep this up to date and you have it publicly exposed and one of these updates is a major security and it did happen last year, um, you have problems. But good news is if you have PFSense or a good router that has VPN built in, you VPN, you reverse proxy it, you can configure this and have it all set up and uh, easily get into it there. Yes, NextCloud is in the 18 series. That's that's one of the things. It is in the 18 series unless you're running it as a plugin in FreeNAS, which a lot of people do. So I'll probably do a video on how to do it inside of uh, FreeNAS here. But also, yes, I need to do a video on how to load a from scratch system and uh, do it as well. Because then if you're... Um, pieces... Uh, there we go. Go back to NextCloud and finish it. Start update. But yes, they, um, they're they on 18, but in here they're pulling it from 17 in the FreeNAS plugin. But if you're doing it on uh, your own, you can start by loading it up. So I may do a video on how to load that, uh, load NextCloud up. But be warned, you know, if you put these things out and expose them to the web, well, this could be a problem for you unless you keep it all up to date. Ah. Uh, What do I prefer, NextCloud versus G Suite versus Office 360? Honestly, we use G Suite. Um, and the reason we use G Suite, and if you're ever curious, uh, this is something you can always look up yourself. Dig lawrencesystems.com MX. Hey, look, Tom's using G Suite. You can figure out who's using what all the time uh, just by doing a dig and looking their mail records. and. Generally, they're going to have it pointing at whoever is hosting their email. Now, the reason we like G Suite, one, we share a lot of documents with contractors all the time. And I create a document, I share it with an outside contractor. Why do we do that? Well, this is the quickest and easiest way for me to get work done with them and coordinate on a project. It's super easy for them to do. There's no security risk because Google's constantly keeping the security up to date on that. Uh, you can complain all you want about Google's privacy and you'd probably be right about most of it, but they also care that only they have all your data. <laughs> so um, this allows us to do this. Now you can do the same thing inside of um, Office 365 and sharing documents, completely possible, but I find the workflow with G Suite to be very good. It's a very solid system and uh, it, it's something we're used to using and it doesn't need all the extra filtering. So it does a really good workflow. It works amazingly good on the phones as well. Nextcloud works pretty good, but now I have to maintain a server and everything else and any security risk that comes out with it. And I'm now talking about uh, always having to create a bunch of users in there that didn't have to before. Pretty much everyone has a Gmail address. Um, matter of fact, Gmail, they said accounts are almost, I think right now it's still at like 80% of the overall general public email addresses are Gmail. So yeah, it's uh, it's pretty much why we use G Suite. So in case you're wondering, I've heard soft. I've heard people talk about soft ether. I've heard a lot of people tell me it's really slow. Uh, that's why I've gone through OpenVPN. And to my knowledge, soft ether, uh, and we can look this up, has not gone through a code audit. B I T code audit. Let's see, security and reliability is certainly safer than legacy hardware. Oh yeah, but not an actual code audit, security audit. Oh, okay. Security audit of, of VPN finds 11 security vulnerabilities. So yes, it's been gone through it. Um, Did, are they fixed? I'm not clear. The AD error security audit uh, relied heavily on the use of fuzzers. The approach has proven uh, its worth with the discovery of several remote open VPN was in June 2017 and modifications made sought the VPN source code to suit for fuzzing original code for this project. The work made in Google's OS fuzz initiative, which is uh, pretty cool if you haven't dug into that for how fuzzing works. Uh, for King Ud protection soft ether against VPN vulnerabilities, an updated version of soft ether resolves all discovered security vulnerabilities available for download immediately. So yes, sounds like they went through some, uh, it doesn't say who did the security audit, but looks like they may have gone through, so that's good. Security audit in progress. When is this? From 2017. Okay, so they, it looks like they went through some, that's good. 
I don't I I don't really have a reason to use it, so Mm-hmm. Let's see, follow the guides on the channel that mentioned. Yeah. I had similar setup last year, 32 gig. Oh, and let me scroll back because I seen in here. Thank you, Simon Greener, for the donation. It is much appreciated. Uh, I love when anyone throws a little money my way. It does help. Uh I don't remember where I started my pitchfork and torch. <laughs> Other things we wanted to talk about here. It's hard sometimes to keep up with all the discretion. Um, I'm going to do a video on the whole outlawing encryption thing soon. The whole Earn It Bill is a disaster. So, yes. Our Earn It Bill is trying to outlaw encryption without approval from the government. Yeah, the Earn It Bill is a disaster that I hope gets shut up. Um, the EFF is on our side. Donate to them. That's part of our podcast we did last night, where we had a discussion about that as well. Now, other things to talk about. Uh... Ooh, um, this LTS. Um, I'm going to do a video on this. So thank you. And unfortunately, I can't call you out by name because I forgot who. Um, one of you said, hey, this is a cool program. And we're going to create a new diagram. We're going to go to networks. And you're not wrong. This, I played with this uh, forever ago. And... It has come a long way since I played with it. I am really impressed with how well this works. So I started redoing even our own network drawings all in this. And I used this for about a few hours just redoing uh, redoing things. I wanted to see how good it was. And I was like really happy. Uh, so whoever, and maybe you're on this uh, today, whoever recommended Draw.io, um, which actually went through a name change, love this program. It works great. I am really happy with it. So... Um, we're going to pull up a couple different diagrams in here. So we'll go through and show. Where's another one that I really liked? That one I didn't like. I'm just pulling up a couple different templates. But I'm going to do a tutorial on this particular software. It's one of the easier ones. One, it's open source. It's free. Um, I really, I'm pretty impressed with it overall too. So it's easy enough to build out and add things in here. So if I need to add another piece, I can just go like this, like this, and start renaming each one of the servers. If I had uh, process and flow work going on, it can save things locally. I'm running this as a local app image. This is um, really, I'm, I'm just like I said, my overall impression of it is kind of like, wow, this is really nice. What's also really nice is the number of things that are in here. Like we have all kinds of really great icons and tools to start dragging things in here and getting them attached to each other like that. Do you notice how I dragged in there? We attached it. Attaching things is actually pretty easy. So I can actually, there we go. These two are now attached. And it also remembers, this is one of those pet peeves, but boy, they did a great job. It remembers defaults. So let's say we turn this into a rounded one and I want to increase the font a little bit. So let's make it a heavy rounded red. Now I'm going to drag this again over to here and we'll drag another one. If I'm not mistaken, oh, it didn't do it this time. It, if once you start with them, you, you can start changing things and remember some of the defaults. There's a few little quirks like that, but I really like it from a drawing program. Um, it, it's probably one of the more intuitive ones as far as ease of use. Huge number of icons in here. Matter of fact, when we go over here, we have AWS icons to build your AWS in, in a variety of them. Azure, cloud and enterprise, like just general ones. Cisco, Cisco 19, Cisco safe. Huge numbers here. Citrix, which is actually, they have some nice icons here. I, I don't use any of their products uh, anymore, but uh, Google Cloud Platform, IBM, Kubernetes. So if you're building out your Kubernetes workflow, they have all the icons to get that explained. Business diagrams and everything else, because it's more than, I mean, obviously we're going to lean towards uh, electrical, but it has a whole floor plan design in here too. Material design, web icons, general signs. Um, they also have Active Directory. So if you want to lay out your Active Directory and talk about each function of it. Um, also Android, Atlassian, uh, Bootstrap. So like that's a lot, uh, a lot going on in here.
Yeah, yeah, I seen that. Like I said, it looks like Soft Ether did fix that, so that's definitely good. I just don't really use it. Hi from quarantine in the UK. Thanks for all that you do, Tom. Learning so much uh, from your videos, especially Freenias and PF Sense. Just wanted to show my appreciation. Uh, that is from Martin McDonald. Thank you, Martin McDonald. It is much appreciated. I definitely goes in the uh, uh, the fund here. So awesome. Use a generated client from PF Sense under client export. Yes, if I didn't show that because I did the Linux one. Um, once you set this up, and I'll do a new video, I guess, because a lot of people are going to ask this question. If you go to OpenVPN, Client Export, right here's the Windows one. So if you want the installer, you just download the Windows installer. And there it is. And I'm running Linux, that's why I didn't. But uh, there's your Windows Windows installer right there. OpenVPN, PFSense Lab, UDP install 2.48. Uh, and that comes bundled with all the configuration and everything else in it. I just downloaded the actual file itself right here. Um, right here. So this is what a file looks like. And because um, OpenVPN is already loaded in Linux, all you need is this file. You don't actually need the um, installer when you run this in Linux. So in it, I've done an OpenVPN video for Linux, and it's it, in some ways Linux is easier because Linux natively has OpenVPN built in. Windows, you have to load it. That's why you have to load that on there. Um, hopefully that makes sense. Uh, what Linux distro do I use? Uh, Pop! OS. I'm still thrilled with Pop! OS. It works great. It's solid. It's very reliable. Um, can you do the new VPN for a week weekend? My old VPN video is still relevant. So uh, it's not irrelevant yet. So it's not there. So uh, what do I suggest for open VPN to disconnect? Log files. Everything's in the log files. Di uh, status, system logs, open VPN. Right here. This is the secret to figuring everything out. Other secret to figuring thing out with open VPN. Maybe I should do OpenVPN troubleshooting. It's probably turn this off because when you wrap everything in a TLS key, it's harder to see if there's an error. If it connects without the TLS key, great. Um, then you can go ahead and start uh, troubleshooting it. But if you have no connectivity and you're trying to really troubleshoot it, uh, just turn this off and uh, work it from there. So, but yeah, for the most part, my, my VPN video on how to set up OpenVPN is still relevant. They've only added more options, but you can leave those options they've added at default. So my old video is not irrelevant, like I said. Uh, I just want to do a new one because I'll talk about those extra options they add. I've had no problems with my uh, Pop! OS updates on my uh, IBM L480, so it works great. I have no interest in using uh, zero tier with a bridge inside of PFSense. It's neat. It's le I mean, I know there's some specific use cases for it, but it's not officially supported, so I don't add it. Does the new release have the option not to use circular login? I actually think that's something that's in the details. Uh, they made that logging change. I'd have to dig in there. I think they turn. I think they're uh, deprecating it. I don't know for sure if it's going to be in in this release or in this one. So let me look because uh, uh, let's see. So it is for sure right here is the two point five circular logging to plain text logging is in here for. Um, in the 2.5. I did not see that, and I'll double check again. I don't think that's in the 2.4 though. So let's go there. I didn't see it in here, so let's look. Nope, it doesn't look like it's one of the errata changes there. So it's coming in 2.55, it's not in 2.45. So Mark Linford, thank you for the donation of $5. Your Let's Encrypt HA proxy videos inspired me to set up reverse proxying. Awesome. Yeah, especially that one I did about reverse proxy because you can wildcard it. That just, you only have to get one cert and then you can apply it to everything on there. So
So that's um, definitely a great way to do that if you want to use that. So I have... Uh, I don't do much Mac. I have so few requests for any type of Mac things. So not... I mean, cool that Mac supports it and has an option for that client, but it's uh, the requests are very, very few. Let's build another drawing. So I need to redo my lab drawings. That's what I need to work on. So let's create a new dry diagram, and we'll drag this over here. What else do they have in here? Business ones. Low charts. These are the real exciting ones. Process diagrams for business. Charts. This looks complicated. Oh, cloud stuff. Great. There we go. AWS Clue, Amazon DB, Amazon Athena. Neat. Amazon Cognito. This is for your Active Directory and all this. This is fun. I really like this. This is a, um, like I said, this drawing program, having the templates so you can start something uh, is actually a really nice feature. So... Do, 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 create new diagram. I'll we'll play with one more. What else do we have? We have a miscellaneous one. That's interesting. You know what else it has? I've I seen this, and we can export as HTML. Include a copy, public URL, all pages. Export. We're going to want to export this. Let's call it Untitled Network Layout. Uh, pull out the network layouts over here. Go to network layouts. I don't even know where that tried to open. I don't, I lost that file. Uh, I'll drag, hold on, I'll drag it over here. There we go. That's interesting. So this is what it looks like, I guess. Does it have any functionality? No, it's just an image inside of here. Neat, I guess. Wait, why is there an is there an edit? Oh, that's actually even more clever. So it actually brought the edit here brought me to draw .io, draw.io to edit this. That's going to be kind of interesting because now I can actually probably embed these and then it will embed it itself and bring it. These, I, this is why I've been playing with this is I want to learn all about it so I can do a pretty extensive video. It probably has a lot more features than I even uh, realized were available in there because it has a web-based version. If you don't want to load anything, you can just load from the website itself and start drawing on the diagram. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. From your R6 video, four SSDs Nitro on a RAID 10 or four SSDs Nitro uh, SAS drives. They are four SAS drives RAID 10. I did that video on there, and um, it's uh, it's pretty fast. Uh, Zen. Do I still have it running? No. Uh, here we go. Windows. But uh, yeah, this is, it, it boots, even Windows boots fast here, which is impressive. I also, uh, could people ask me to do a Hyper-V comparison? Um, but one of the things about it is my first reason I wouldn't want to use Hyper-V compared to XCPG, look how long this takes to boot. Like Windows is churning away here pulling just it pulls more hard drive than xcpng has in data so it, it's just like funny because I, I when i look at how much windows is just churning away at the hard drive how long updates take on it and everything else i'm just like really like it, it and this is supposed to be what runs the hypervisor. I know you can run it from command line for Hyper-V as well, but now it's harder to manage and you can manage it from within another. Uh, it just seems much more complicated um, and less efficient than running XCPNG and putting things like Windows inside of it, especially because we're applying settings because we got the Active Directory stuff and everything that's starting on there. Of course, I've seen people argue don't build your Active Directory and don't tie your hypervisor Active Directory to your main hyper direct Active Directory of your main system because if you did that, then there's a security problem. If they get if someone gets their credentials for one, they have the credential for both. So yeah, so it's just 
it's a problem. Yes, all 300 of you now. Thank you, 300 people. That's awesome. And yes, smash the like button for sure. Yeah, running Hyper-V without a GUI is the best way. But it, at some point, when I, I don't think Hyper-V has near the features that you get with um, XCPNG. So let's uh, type a password in here. I think I typed the right password. Hey, I did. Cool. Even our demo machines have long passwords. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When it's done churning the hard drive because it's Windows. So Windows is like, hold on, I booted. Let me just churn the hard drive for a little while because I'm still starting services. So let's see how long this takes. <laughs> Uh, yes, you can configure HA proxy URLs for subdirectories to access backend servers. That is completely something that can be done. Uh, I'll actually. bring that over to another screen while we watch, watch windows just grind 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 let me just suck the cpu out of this and i'm just not a fan sometimes of the whole i i like dogging on windows because they make it easy that's that's my big reason <laughs> so when you're um i here's the reverse proxy video i did for doing things privately when you do here Host starts with, host ends with, host matches, host regex. So if you look at these, you can do different ones. I did gibberish uh, host matches, but you can also say host ends with as an option in HA proxy for that too. So um, there's a lot of different ways. So I had a one called gibberish, one called free NAS, and uh, this is part. This was from my demo, but you can see here you can change it to matching end. So host ends with, and then put whatever slash. So you can actually create one. Uh, fully qualified domain or subdomain, and then you can also put in uh, a slash to redirect or change options on it. Matter of fact, it's more than just that. These are the uh, matching rules, and these are the all the different options that come with it. So it's actually more than just using a different custom backend. You can actually also redirect them somewhere. So you can actually build a series of, for example, redirect. So one rule matches next rule, then redirect to the next rule to do the different things. So. Uh, Hyper-V is not a terrible platform. I mean, it's probably not the worst, but it's certainly, uh, I mean, why? I don't know. It just, it irks me how Windows is a, such a resource hog. I mean, I get it. There's a lot in there, but it's also kind of a resource hog. But this is my production system, and we'll show you, like I did in the video, uh, for those wondering how fast is it. So there's the R630. There's all the things that are doing stuff. There's booting Windows. Um, go to hosts, R630. These are all the things running on it at the moment. Go back over to Windows, and what kind of performance should we expect out of the disk? Why not? So I will we'll do three passes. Do all. So we'll just let it churn this drive and see what kind of performance gate. So yeah, I did this video the other day. Um, someone said I said byte, not bit, and some one someone called me out on it. I was inaccurate. I, I'm agreeing with them, so that's important. So <laughs> can you load OpenSense on a PFSense appliance? Never tried. Might work. Yeah. Only problem with Hyper-V is that it runs on Windows. And when Windows updates come, like they take a long time. I, I would be really worried loading Windows updates because, you know, we can show you how fast how fast the updates go. Matter of fact, um, Windows, I'm running a beta, so this is not. Let's go in the lab. So let me go over to my lab. So we're going to stop things running in my lab right now. So shut them down. We're going to show a demo live. We're going to update something live. 
Back over here, what else? Uh, we shut down this lab. So six, yes. And what else do we have on here? We'll shut down this. So all the lab stuff just stopped running. What we're gonna do is SSH into this box right here because it needs updates. See the patches? Oops, it's 2.06, yep. All right, get your clock started here, folks. How fast can we update a machine running XEPNG? Uh, let's see, what time is it? 3.56 and we're done. Oh, no, I'm sorry, I, I lied, that was the download part. Uh, now we're done. Well, that was about 30 seconds, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you can see how quick you can update this and show me any Windows server that can patch that fast. Even if you had it on the fastest NVMEs, Windows just grinds away at an update. And this is one of those things, like for your hypervisor, that's crazy. Um, oh yeah, that's the other thing, uh, the size of the updates and everything else. But this is why I think this makes a better platform to host things on. Uh, so it's... It's one of those things, like it's just a big mess and um, I don't know. It's not what I would want to base my hypervisor that runs my company on because, I mean, even when it comes to reboot time here, we're going to go ahead and restart this. Uh, actually, we'll shut down virtual machines because we have one VM running on here. So we'll do this, this. We'll shut down this VM, press F8. It'll shut this down, which is actually what's running behind me. That took three seconds. Quit. And it'll reboot. Now, as far as reboot time, this machine, our lab machine is relatively fast. So it's going to take all of about, I'm willing to bet this will be up within one minute. So, oops, uh, what I, I, I type time. I meant to say what time is it, but it's 3.58 and 13 seconds. So we'll give it a uh, one minute and it should reboot. So how is your keyboard so quiet? I really like quiet keyboards. I used to like loud keyboards, but then I started making videos and realized that um, I like the quiet one better. Yeah, even if installing updates, do not restart your computer. It takes an hour. And then sometimes there's more updates for your updates after you update it because then it wants to do some applying things. So... <laughs> I don't remember the name of the keyboard I have. It's this one. It looks cool. I don't know. It's a uh, Red Dragon. So in case you're wondering what I type on. So what time is it now? Nope, not up yet. It's been almost a minute. Uh, do you have a video on how to assign a public IP to a server? That's not, oh, look, it's back up and running. So now this system back up and running in one minute. For, so like Windows would still be loading the updates. <laughs> hey, Chris from Crosstalk, how's it going? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't argue about running Windows. I'm just saying I run Windows, but we'll, if we're virtualizing it, we'll virtualize it with XCPNG rather than virtualizing it with Windows. Uh, that's the part that doesn't make as much sense because it's just there. And right here, pull up. This is some pretty reasonable numbers on a production machine that's in use with other VMs running on it to get this level of speed out of the drives. So uh, it's, it's fast. Um, it's not because I've seen people saying, well, you know, I mean, there are trade offs when you put things and virtualize them. Yes, you absolutely uh, will slow them down. But that being said, they're not they're not awful uh, if you have the right hardware.
Yeah, there, the Windows update is just a mess in general. Uh, the other thing nice is before you do an update, you can always just snapshot it before doing the update. And then if the update goes insane or like the last one that broke a bunch of files and things like that, well, then it goes through and uh, breaks it will, you will have to uh, roll it back. Well, Windows rollback doesn't always work, but if you do snapshot because it's it's from the hypervisor taking a snapshot of the drive, not Windows, you have a much better chance of restoring things to a uh, working state. So, yeah, we only virtualize servers. It's rare we virtualize any of the desktops. Uh, that's that's not frequent at all. Pretty much, it's just the servers that get virtualized. And when you look at you know everything we're running um, on our system here, like this is all the different tools that run. You, matter of fact, you may notice nothing in here. All of these, even our Screen Connect server, all of these run on uh, Linux. Nothing. See a little. Actually, I'm a Debian fan. If you can't tell, because every server we have here is running Debian. My Zabbix server. Um, for monitoring, Bitwarden. By the way, I love Bitwarden. I uh, I can't say enough good things about it. I'm an, I'm a regular user of that. Oh, what else do we have? What are some of the other questions? We keep, you know, I was doing all these drawings. I got all this. So these are all things we've been talking about. Well, even more because uh, all these actually. The lab is up and running too. The lab boots up right away. If you're not familiar with how that works, you just check the auto power on box. Pretty straightforward to uh, get that. So when it restarts, it restarts this or any other VMs we want, which we only have, what else do we have in here? I gotta do some new Untangle. There's a new version of Untangle. I don't have it loaded yet on here, so. Uh, there's not really any good monitoring program to track user activity in PFSense, not that I'm aware of. Tracking user activity is a little bit tricky. Untangle is the only one that really has a lot of, they, um, a lot of stuff in there for that. So, uh, SolarWinds price hike, no thoughts. Things, things cost more money. Payroll's due on Friday. Payroll is always substantially more expensive than my SolarWinds bill. So I don't like it when they raise prices. We negotiate and argue with them. Uh, but, you know, so it is it is what it is. Things get more expensive. What else do we have in here? Uh, do, 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 do. Bitwarden stores data and relational database, which seems a bit limited. Mm -hmm. KeyPass based things are non relational database, uh, rather more flexible. So, such as having a big note session. I don't think that's an issue with uh, Bitwarden. I, I, it's quite extensive. Um, my only, my only complaint with Bitwarden, the only, and there is another version that doesn't do this. The only complaint I specifically have with Bitwarden is the fact that Bitwarden does rely on Microsoft SQL, but you can get a different, uh, there's another uh, Bitwarden implemented in Rust that they redid it to not to rely on MySQL or uh, Microsoft SQL. So good and bad. I live with it, the fact that it does it because it works so well. Um, I'm super happy with it as a product. Maybe they'll change it in the future and that'll be great. But yeah. Um, the newest PFSense seems a lot faster in their web page responses. Mm, I don't know. I didn't notice any difference. It works. Uh, oops. Post not available, why not? Yeah, I broke something. I'll figure that out. This is a beta server, by the way, in case you didn't know. <laughs> Who knows what I broke? I have, to, I have to dig into what error, actually. Why isn't that starting? Did, hold on. Post storage. That's why. No host fail. So the storage is disconnected for some reason. Weird. Eh, I'll think. Oh, 
I might know what's wrong. I I gotta plug something in. <laughs> that's that's a different problem. Yeah, so this is up and running, so I'll have to sort that out. Anyways, any more good for the class here? Thank you all for coming. I'm, I'll answer a few more questions. I have actually, I've been invited as a special guest to do a, another podcast. Um, so I'm going to do that here in about another half hour, but I do have a few more minutes. What are some of the, um, what are some of the other questions that you have? So why why Proxmox? Me and Jay, and I think I did a video on this, Proxmox versus KVM. Part of its preference, part of its scalability. I really like how scalable um, XCPNG is. There's, uh, it's pro but Proxmox is a solid product. If you like Proxmox, use it. I prefer XCPNG. There's no real problem I have with Proxmox. I just like the larger, and we have more clients using XCPNG. So it's what I'm more familiar with. Uh, Jay has some Proxmox videos, Jay from Learn Linux TV. So uh, he focuses on that. I focus on uh, this, but it comes down to preference. Use the one you like the best. I like XCPNG the best. What else do we have in here? Bitwarden via Docker container doesn't do too many resources. It's not terrible, so um, it's reasonable. Yeah, everyone, thumbs up. I got to, uh, let me drag this, actually, do this window and drag this one over. There we go. I have 105 likes. Before we end this, how many of you can click that like button, smash it or something, right? PF sense ISP behind CGNAT? I don't know. I, I, I imagine it supports CGNAT. So, yes. And tomorrow, me and Chris are doing a video. So, Yes, let's get that promoted out real quick. So let's go over here to Twitter and Crosstalk tweeted it. I believe I retweeted it. Crosstalk Solutions. Right here. Tune in to Crosstalk Solutions this Friday, March 27th at 12 p.m. Pacific time, which is sometime in the morning for me. Um, I'll, I'll figure that out with Chris. <laughs> um, bring your questions, and if you have any topics you'd like to discuss, I'll reply to this tweet. Hope to see everyone. Um, discuss, earn it. We, yeah, that's fair enough. This is an interesting one. But we can talk about that, though. I like you guys talk about unified firewall rules and how to implement them for advanced home automation VLAN projects. My answer is usually just use PFSense. <laughs> but yes, me and Chris will be doing it uh, tomorrow. So uh, afternoon. Yeah. Well, it's morning Morning for Tom. Uh, afternoon for Chris. I think that's how it works. Wait, no, afternoon for me. I'm, Chris is behind, so it's going to be later. Uh, time zones are hard. So... Uh, what time? Here, we can figure this out right now. Pacific time. It's currently 1.08 p.m. So that sounds like it's going to be 3 o'clock Eastern time and 12 t uh, Chris's time. <laughs> I think I did that right. Other direction. Thank you, Chris. Time zones are hard. <laughs> Chris, Chris will let me know, and I, I put it, I put it in my calendar properly. So I should have just pulled my calendar over here. It's in my calendar to the right time. So don't worry, Chris. I'll be there. <laughs> we'll make it. We'll make it happen. Uh, let's see. I have an SS Coolmaster. Blah blah blah. Uh, will I make installation video for the new PF Sense? Yeah, I, I need to do a new video on PF Sense that is highly on my to do list. Um, to, Cause I think the last walkthrough I did was probably in the two, three series. So, you know, 2.45 seems like a good enough one, especially cause they changed a few things on there and added a few features. Um, the one thing is PF sense is pretty interface stable since the last time I've done it. So even this is one of the reasons my videos stay relevant from on PF sense longer because they don't uh, change the interface a lot from version to version and update to update. So that is a, uh, a nice feature. Whoops. There we go. I want to put this here. I like that better. Anyways, so uh, FreeNAS, OMV, or Unraid, FreeNAS all day, every day. I don't care. I mean, Open Media Vault, if you like it, go ahead. Uh, I don't I don't have anything against Unraid or Open Media Vault, but I am a FreeNAS person through and through. So uh, Wendell did an Unraid versus FreeNAS, if I'm not mistaken, from Level 1 Text. So if you're looking for some information, 
um, go to the level one text. Text, uh, free NAS versus, I think he did. Oh, there we go. Look at this. Today's so name. you guys can watch this grudge match that he did on uh, in November. So free NAS versus Unrage grudge match uh, for everyone that keeps wanting that. Level 1 Tex, uh, wonderful channel if you're not subscribed. You probably are if you've heard of me, heard of Chris, you've heard of Level 1 Tex. Uh, so, but he has a video on, on both of those on there. Uh, do, do, do. How do you, I don't understand the word, all the configuration on all the things you have, like system configuration. Huh? Uh, yes, it is sad times um, in terms of getting things fast. Many tech things are not coming very fast right now, so that's certainly going to be an issue. Uh, heads up on that. Sorry, I wish that was not the case, uh, but it is the case. So you are going to have to have some delays on some of those things. So, yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh... Oh, people. Okay. I'm just making sure someone's canceling, but it's not the podcast canceling. So, uh, let's see. Yeah, Unraid's kind of cool. I mean, there's a lot of people. There's a couple of people who do a lot of Unraid videos. I don't think it's a bad thing, uh, but I don't use it. So, watch their videos. Yeah, Amazon, four weeks for a power supply. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's definitely an issue. Uh... Yes, I did tweet about not updating unless it has uh, you access. I say that in my video very specifically. If you don't have physical access, this is not a do or die uh, type of update. This is not one that is a security update where you have to get this done. So yes, please make sure you have physical access to the machine um, in order to do this. So do you... I'm reading all the comments on here. Uh, dude, wow, there's a lot. I'll wait my customary. I don't like someone said. I'll even wait my customary. Um, the uh, two or three weeks before the update. So. <laughs> Anyways. Uh, yeah, there's going to be some delays in shipping. I see people talking about it. I'm not here to commiserate with you on it, though. It is what it is. I will just. I'm, we're running with it, moving with it. Is there anything else? Because I have to get prepared for our next podcast. I got to send, uh, they just emailed me asking uh, to go over the, they have a show outline they want me to do. I don't have a ton. Uh, well, I know the message I'm not, it's a new podcast. It's someone who writes for a newspaper that wanted me to do it, uh, like big newspaper, big media outlets. So I'm going to have to get prepared for that. I have a couple things to do is I know my staff has some questions. Um, so awesome that this many of you are here. I may do some more live stuff. And I'm trying to work on some ideas and maybe get some hangouts together. And, and I know a lot of people are sequestered to their homes. And I, I, I don't mind uh, doing a few more of these because I'm among the people who, but I do this all the time. You know, I, I, I couldn't help but tweet that meme. It was so relevant. Like when you realize your lifestyle is actually called shelter in place, I'm like, oh, that's me not leaving. And I, I think Chris from Crosstalk, we were laughing. He's got the same thing. He's like, I, I leave. Why would I leave? I like sitting here in front of the computer. <laughs> I don't really want to go out and deal with the real world. And and now we all don't have to go out and deal with the real world. So more of you can help, uh, can join in on these. I was really excited to see this many people um, on here. So thank you for everyone that came here. Uh, look for videos. I will be getting in depth on draw.io. I will be doing some more videos, um, you know, and as long as I'm healthy and feeling well, I'm going to be cranking out videos. I am being very conscious of uh, not being around too many people. And yes, some of my staff are working remotely and anyone who has questions about that. Uh, maybe me and Chris, uh, we're talking about talking in depth about that type of, you know, remote workers. Uh, for us, it's a little bit easier because we've already had remote workers. Um, but I'm also coordinating, helping more of my clients get remote workers set up. So, all right, and thanks. Like, subscribe, smash like buttons. I see 141 likes uh, before this is over. It'd be great to see a few more. Thanks.